tātou, uh, tia tahi, ka mihi atu uh, hau, e ki tō tātou kaihana i runga rawa, nā nei timata, nā nei tangu nā mea katoa nō re rā, whakakorori a ki tōna ingo e tapu nā wā katoa. Ka mihi o ki a hau, ki nā mate o te wā, <coughs> e ki a nei, me mui rā tau, me mui rā tau, me mui rā tau. Ka hoki mai ki te huna ora, a ko tātou e nei, kai te, kai te nui uh, te mihi, te mihi ki a tātou i te nei wā. <coughs> Ka nui te mihi uh, ki te mana whenua nā ti whātua, uh, nā rātau e pupuri nei i te Māori o tēnei whenua. Uh, ka nui te mihi ki a rātau mā. Ka nui te mihi ki te whare e tū nei. Uh, hui, ana te, uh, hui te ana nui a uh, tangaroa, ka nui te mihi ki a ia. Uh, ka nui te mihi uh, ki te papa e takoto wai, takoto mai rā, uh, me te moana, uh, wai te matā, uh, ka nui te mihi ki a ia e whakapia te mai i, I, I tēnei wā. Uh, ko ahu nei nā, uh, ko mā tātua te waka, uh, ko tūhoe, ko nā te awa, uh, ko te whakatōhia, uh, o ko iwi, uh, me nā te kahungunu anō hoki. Uh, ko ahu nei nā, ko Jason Mika tō ko ingoa, ka nui te mihi ki a tātou. Kia ora everyone. Uh, very pleased to be here. Thanks uh, very much, Jess, uh, for the warm welcome uh, uh, this morning, and uh, it's really lovely to see uh, so many people here this morning uh, to be with you. And thanks, Nick, for uh, opening up and uh, putting on a good show there, Nick. Um, very pleased to be here from Palmerston North uh, Massey University in the Business School, Massey Business School, uh, with uh, Te Aurangaho. Um Today, I'm going to be talking about um, a Māori marine economy and uh, what that looks like. Just briefly. Uh, you know, I know we've got busy days, so we don't have all day uh, to talk about that, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so it's a, it's a blue economy from a Māori perspective, uh, based on some research that we're doing uh, with the uh, Sustainable Seas uh, National Science Challenge. Uh, before I get into that, um, just want to uh, say a big mihi to Auckland and uh, uh, express my affinity for Tāmaki Makoto. There's a saying here from the Ngāti Whātua people, uh, te pai me te whairawa o Tāmaki. The beauty and the abundance of Tāmaki, and it sure is uh, looking beautiful today. So, um, a big mihi to uh, the people from here. Uh, my dad, uh, my credentials, and I'm not a fisherman, I'm not a scientist, and uh, more sort of in the economics and entrepreneurship sort of uh, resource development uh, aspect. But uh, my credentials uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the Waitamata here comes through my dad, Paul Pettit. He used to, um, he, uh, he used to tell me uh, he was the only, uh, the only person that he knew that had a boat parked at White, uh, what is it, West Haven Marina that uh, drove on a 10-speed bike to get to his boat. Everyone else cruised past in a BMW or a Porsche or something, and now there was dad cycling on his 10-speed bike, and it was a pretty huckery-looking bike too. Uh, but he'd get there, and he had this 80-year-old uh, catch uh, called the Vagabond, parked out in White uh, West Haven Marina. And uh, he used to try and drag me along there, go and have a beer on the, uh, on the boat with him, and he'd just sort of reminisce, you know. We wouldn't go sailing or anything. One day, we were, uh, we were just sitting in the boat. <laughs> and uh, one day he says, oh, uh, how about we take it for a spin? And I says, what do you mean? Does it still work? And he goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we'll just go home and get the sails and put it up and what way we go. And this catch was 80 year old, you know, it was 80 years old and it looked 80 years old. This is like 25 years ago. And he says, oh yeah, all right then. And so off we went down the harbour, you know, uh, in this catch and we had no gear, no food, no lights, uh, no safety, nothing. And uh, we were just sailing by and we, uh, oh, it's getting dark then. Uh, shouldn't we turn back? He said, no, 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 we keep going. And uh, we get out to Rangitoto Island, and I, said, I, can hear the, I can hear the waves crashing on the rocks, Dad. I think we're pretty close. He says, all right, we'll stop. We stop there in the middle of a shipping lane. No, no lights. And I says, Dad, what are we going to eat? There's a can of beans there and a bottle of stout there. That'll keep us going till morning. Sure enough, next day, off we are uh, back zigzagging. And we had to zigzag all the way back up to the harbour just to uh, get back, and it took us nine hours to get from Rangitoto back to uh, the harbour. Then the motor gave way, and <laughs> we had to sing out for someone to tow us in. And, um, you know, but uh, Dad loved the ocean, and he was also, uh, uh, just one last little story before I get into the kōrero, is uh, he was also uh, a cook on uh, Radio Hauraki's uh, titty, and he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And they were rolling around in the, in the Hauraki Gulf there, and uh, uh, that was one of the best times of his life. And, uh, 
So, um, yeah, that's my dad, that's my credentials for this little place here. Uh, and I've got a few more stories, but we'll save it for morning tea. Uh, now, uh, the research that we're doing, now, uh, Nick gave a really good definition of what a blue economy is. This is our definition. Whai rawa, whai mana, whai oranga. Uh, you know, creating an indigenous blue economy. And uh, our research team, we spent about two days having a little bit of a wānanga, having a bit of a hui about what does a Māori marine economy actually look like? What does that actually mean? Two days later, we come back. Oh, it's actually the title of our research project, uh, Whai Rawa, Whai Mana, Whai Oranga. Uh, and for us, the Māori marine economy is all about well-being. You know, we had a, a well-being budget uh, this year, you know, 2019, uh, about 700 years ago, the Māori people had a had a well-being economy called the Māori marine economy. And uh, that whole economy was about the well-being of whānau hapu, feeding, feeding our families, our, our, our hapu, our, our tribes, uh, and looking after uh, what we had. And uh, those values and principles are really uh, underpinning our research. So we're doing a bit of literature review. We've done that, had a look at uh, what is a traditional, I guess, Māori uh, view of the, uh, uh, the fishing uh, and, uh, and marine environment, uh, doing some case studies. Wow, that's spooky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ooh. Okay, all right. I thought that was the way to uh, come in to remind us, uh, you know. <laughs> Woo. Mm, it might have been Tangaroa giving us a message. Uh, and then, uh, so we've got some case studies, I'll talk a little bit about those towards the end. A survey, I'm doing a survey, so asking people what does the Māori marine economy look like to them and how they're managing, uh, I guess, to incorporate their, you know, traditional values and aspirations with the modern demands of, of running a marine-based enterprise, but also these uh, other aspects of sustainability. Then we're also talking to people, got to talk to people about your research, Robin keeps saying, where's Robin? Yes. No one knows about the research, well, what's going to change? So we've got to talk to people, so we're engaging with people. We have some advice. Good thing about uh, uh, research, got to get good advice. And we've got a Mātauranga Māori Advisory Committee, a couple of sirs, a judge, uh, and a distinguished professor, and a tribal uh, chief executive uh, who's engaged in this uh, customary and also the commercial aspects of Māori fisheries. So they provide us with guidance, advice, uh, and uh, act as a kōrawai, you know, a bit of a cloak of protection, and uh, advice when we, uh, just to steer us through what we're doing. Our research team, we've got a big research team, there's about uh, 10 of us now, and uh, we're from all over the show. Uh, Canterbury University, we've got the, Dr. John Reid, and also Dr. Matthew Rout, um, and others from Auckland University, uh, scientists uh, and economists, and lawyers got, got the works. And uh, so um, we're very blessed to have a, an amazing team of researchers uh, who have been on this, uh, this project with us and uh, producing some great stuff. One of the, uh, I guess the points, the starting point for us is um, uh, what I was talking to uh, uh, Tony about just, just before we started about our connection with uh, Aotearoa started in Hawaii. You know, uh, for the Māori people, it started out in the, uh, the Pacific Ocean uh, and our ancestors making their way across the Pacific using traditional technologies, uh, knowledge about the stars, the currents, the weather, climate, uh, in order to uh, find their way here, and they did, and they settled. And they didn't just stay here, they went back and forward uh, and established uh, their lives here and created an environment, a Māori marine economy, a Māori land-based economy based on tribal uh, structures. Uh, and we acknowledge um, one of the wakas here, I think this, is, this waka is just parked out here. Uh, so uh, we acknowledge uh, that traditional knowledge and the people that hold it uh, and, uh, and that really underpins our, our research. One of the other things that we had another wānanga about, another two-day wānanga, to talk about, um, I guess, what is the Māori perspective of uh, uh, the blue economy, but also this concept of ecosystem-based management. 
which Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge is really focusing its attention on. And uh, for us, Mātauranga uh, Māori, Mātauranga, the knowledge uh, of the, I guess, the Māori people, for us that EBM concept, the ecosystem-based management concept, really plays out in terms of a, a waka, a canoe. And for us, the waka is te ao Māori, the Māori world, te ao Pākehā, the, the Pākehā world, that knowledge and how does it work together? How do we integrate that knowledge uh, so that we achieve really uh, positive outcomes? And so we have to think about what is our common purpose uh, and how do we work together? How do we uh, paddle those waka in the same direction? And what is that direction? And just thinking about our ancestors, you know, setting off from Hawaii Nui, Hawaii Roa, Hawaii Palmama, what were they thinking? What was their vision? What was driving them? And we're in that position now. You know, if you think about it, we're back there. Uh, so we have to use the best of all those knowledges uh, to create a really positive future for us and our kids. Uh, just taking us back, uh, before Captain Cook arrived and opened up Aotearoa to the world, um, Māori people had a system of managing the marine economy, the marine environment that was based on their tribal structures. It was really localised. There was autonomy at the whānau level to provide for and manage the marine resources within their areas uh, according to uh, chiefly authority. Uh, and so it was really about survival, uh, nurturing those resources to feed whānau, to feed hapu. Uh, and there was a system of property rights uh, in terms of who got what uh, resources or what areas to manage according to the tikanga of that time. And for us, it's what were those principles that enabled that uh, marine economy to be sustainable, uh, to provide for the well-being of whānau, hapu and iwi, uh, and bringing those into our thinking today. One of the areas that we focus on in our research is this idea of, uh, well, how did, we, how did Māori come to be involved in the Māori marine economy of today? And we have to go back to the Treaty of Waitangi, 1840. Uh, now, from that time, uh, inside the Treaty of Waitangi, Māori rights to forestries and fisheries and all these sorts of things were protected. Yes, Māori people, the tribes of Aotearoa, uh, retained ownership and interest in their fisheries and their marine environments. Uh, and if, if, uh, if they chose to well, sell them, uh, to release them, then someone had to buy it and it had to be the Crown. The problem is the Crown didn't buy Māori fisheries interests. They didn't buy it. Uh, it was still under customary title, uh, customary control, uh, but the Crown assumed that they did. And they just made an assumption and started to operate as though they uh, owned all the marine resources, the marine environment, uh, and then it wasn't until we had the quota management system introduced in the 1980s uh, that Māori says, well, actually, you can't do that because you haven't purchased those, uh, those property rights that you're now creating. You have to purchase it. The courts agreed. The Crown got together with Māori and said, well, how can we resolve this? How can we resolve this? And so we have the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Settlement in the late 80s, early 1990s, uh, basically established that, yes, Māori do have commercial and customary fishing rights, uh, and we need to provide for Māori participation in the new uh, marine economy that was being created through, those, through that system. Uh, and <coughs> one of the things that changed as a result of those Treaty of Waitangi fishery settlements is that it shifted power and control of Māori marine economy and those traditional fishing practices away from whānau and hapu towards iwi. So we have the likes of Naitahu and Tainu uh, all sort of uh, managing and controlling Māori commercial and to some extent customary fishing rights and interests. So it was a shift away from whānau and hapu. One of the things that we're trying to do in, in the, uh, the Whairawa, Whaimana, Whaioranga project is to map the Māori marine economy. What does it look like? Uh, what does it look like in terms of its structure, its value, uh, its dynamics? Who are the firms that are participating inside that Māori marine economy? and how they're operating in a distinctly Māori way. 
Now this picture, you won't be able to make sense of this probably, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful little uh, chart uh, that um, maps the institutional environment within which the Māori marine economy operates today. It was created by our, our, uh, our mate uh, Dr John Reid and Dr Matthew Rout down at Canterbury University in the Naitahi Research Centre. So, ka nui te mihi kia, kia John, a rauko, uh, uh, Matt. Um, now, what this explains is, well, <coughs> uh, there's, there's three levels. One is the governmental, the organisational, and the operational level. And across the top are all the different, the different aspects that uh, make up the Māori marine economy. Um, now, we've got the governmental in terms of uh, the legislation. Up the top is all the legislation that really uh, governs uh, how Māori participate and operate within the marine economy. We've got the judicial enforcement administrative arms. So, uh, you know, this is where the agencies come in and MPI is, is particularly influential in that, in that area. Uh, then we've got the Māori marine property rights in terms of customary, uh, private rights, commercial entitlements, uh, and also non-commercial rights. Uh, those flow down to iwi, uh, iwi tribal corporate entities, uh, which manage and control those interests. And uh, then finally get down to the, uh, the fishing, you know, where uh, people uh, have annual catch entitlements and, uh, and uh, the fishing activity happens. Then we've got the marine estate and uh, how that is governed uh, over there. And um, so um, the main, the main uh, uh, point of this, uh, this chart is that, you know, this is the current picture of the institutions that govern how the Māori marine economy works. And one of the objectives of our research in the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge is to influence, well, what should this picture look like? What would this picture look like if we were operating from a kaupapa Māori perspective, a whairawa, a whaimana, a whaioranga perspective, that mātauranga Māori perspective? How would this institutional uh, picture look if we, if we started from that point of view? as opposed to uh, starting with some uh, legislation and some institutions and some activities down there. One of the other questions is, well, what is the value of the Māori marine economy? And as Nick pointed out, there's a whole vast uh, range of activities on the marine environment, tourism activities, uh, fishing and uh, other, other activities. So there's lots of economic activity uh, happening on the marine environment. And for us, we're just getting started at figuring out, well, what is the value of the Māori marine economy? And so for us, we focused on uh, the fishery sector um, and, uh, this, uh, and the data that sits within there. But it's just the start. And uh, the figures, John tells me, that just let everyone know there's provisional. So there's research is just being finalised at the moment. We've got how long? We've got 30th of June before we have to submit our reports. So not long, uh, but it's provisional. Uh, so, um, yeah, this picture here is basically uh, the value of quota owned by Māori entities over $10 million. And you can see there, Naito, $152 million is the value of their quota. Uh, and, uh, and then you've got Ngāpuhi, uh, Kahungunu, Ngāti Parau, and other iwi there with uh, lesser amounts. The point being that Māori now participate uh, in the marine economy through ownership and control and management of uh, fishing quota. And these are other iwi that own uh, lesser amounts between uh, three million and ten million dollars worth of uh, quota. So we've got Te Arawa, Tūhoi, uh, Araukawa, Wakatū, uh, Ngāti Whātua over here, Maniapoto and others. Uh, so it just gives a bit of a picture as to uh, who owns what and the relative value of those assets. Uh, and this picture here is basically um, the value of quota uh, owned by pan Māori, uh, pan iwi and individual Māori entities. Uh, and so here we've got the value of quota owned by individual Māori entities, the iwi, uh, you know, $448 million. Moana New Zealand, New Zealand's uh, biggest Māori fishing company, 243 million, and then Te Ohu Kaimona, the Māori Fisheries Trust, they've got about 
24 million. And this is a bit of a breakdown as to which iwi uh, own uh, uh, bits of uh, Moana, Moana, New Zealand. So we've got uh, Ngāpuhi, Ngāti Palau, Ngāti Kaungunu, uh, owning about a third, uh, quite a few, about a third amongst uh, 48 smaller iwi and then others owning the rest. Uh, in terms of species, rock lobster. It's the biggest uh, share of uh, Māori fishing quota. And then we've got uh, Pawa uh, and uh, Snapper. And, uh, and some other, some other fish, some other tasty fish there. Uh, now, um, this is a chart that shows, uh, I guess, the quota assets acquired, um, in addition to settlement uh, quota that was released through the through the settlement process. So you can see that Naito has uh, has acquired a substantial amount of additional quota uh, following settlement. But if you look at who's, who's been really actively pursuing additional quota uh, and uh, growing their portfolio, uh, Ngāti Whare. Ngāti Whare, anyone know where Ngāti Whare is? You think about Murupara? Anyone know Murupara? Yeah, it's off the beaten track a little bit. Down State Highway 38 from Marotorua. Um, beautiful little place. You know, they don't have any shoreline as such, but you know, they're right in their boots and all. They're into this Māori marine economy. And they are going for it in terms of growing their, uh, their resource base there. Uh, so Māori marine enterprises. So already we can see from that picture of the Māori marine economy that all of the iwi are now involved and participating in the business of fishing in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So they have a say, they have some rights and interests, they have some commercial and customary interests, uh, some quota, and so they are also confronted with the same challenges that all of our fishing industry is confronted with. How do we create a sustainable blue economy for the betterment of, our, uh, of ourselves and our future generations to come? And they are also embarking upon that same question about introducing traditional knowledge and te ao Māori, te ao Pākehā to uh, address those questions. And Māori marine-based enterprises are doing this also. So we have uh, some case study organisations that we're looking at. So uh, Ngāti Kahungunu, Wairua Taifinua in uh, Wairo, uh, Moana, New Zealand, we've done a case study on them. Uh, Ngāi Tahu, Whakatohia, which is heavily involved in the aquaculture industry uh, off the coast there in, in the Bay of Plenty. The Iwi Collective Partnership is another organisation uh, where they basically got about 16 uh, different iwi that are collectivising their quota and uh, selling it to, uh, to the market together. Uh, we've also got a startup firm there, Aotearoa Clams, so a small clams based uh, business startup in uh, Wanganui uh, that's, that's underway as well. So what we've got is different scales and different levels of Māori marine based enterprise, some of them at the tribal level. Uh, some of them at, um, at the hapu level, and then some of them are sort of private Māori enterprises working within the iwi environment uh, to uh, create sustainable enterprises. So one of the challenges for them is how do they balance those cultural imperatives with those commercial imperatives as Māori enterprises? How do they draw on that traditional knowledge about kaitiakitana, about stewardship, about guardianship, about uh, respect for our uh, Tangaroa and uh, Papatua Nuku and Ranginui. How do we do that and how do they do that? And that is the inquiry that we've, uh, we've uh, been uh, working through with each of the case studies. So where are we headed to? Well, we've got some reports to deliver for uh, Julie Hall, our CEO of the uh, challenge uh, by the 30th of uh, June. And, uh, and then we're going to, uh, I think, uh, well, there's another five years, uh, Nick was saying. So there's more work to be done. So we're just at the starting blocks, really, in terms of studying the Māori marine economy. Uh, and um, one of the next phases will be uh, collaboration. So it's not just about the, uh, I guess, the, the Māori-centred research and the sort of Pākehā-centred research. It's how can we work together and collaborate uh, and achieve the best outcomes possible. Kia ora.